Great. Well, welcome, everybody. Yongju and I hope that this proves to be an entertaining and enlightening uh, hour or so together about marriage and bioengineering. Yes. How about that for a combination? Yep. I'm sure many of you have read the book, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. Who, show of hands, who's actually read it? Yeah, there's a few hands up in the, in the audience. Um, it was John Gray. Now, that's not the English uh, professor of, of healthcare improvement and, uh, and innovation, John Gray, that we have here this week, but the American um, psychologist and counsel, relationship counsellor, John Gray, who described the differences between the sexes pointed out some of the fundamental things where, like Martians and Venetians, men and women have different needs, speak different languages, and react in different ways. For example, apparently men don't listen and just want to be Mr. Fix-It, whereas women just want to talk about it. For a marriage to work, we need to understand, we need to celebrate, and we need to make the most of these differences. I can see a few heads nodding in the audience now. <laughs> yep. Yongju and I were just oh, chatting yes. about this before and uh, I was reflecting on being happily married for 20 years but it still certainly seems like a lifelong journey of understanding each other that we're on and, and which, for which the road disappears off into the distance. In this session, we'll draw parallels between successful marriages and the partnerships that are needed for successful healthcare innovation. Like some marriages produce offspring, a successful innovation could be thought of as the fruits of a marriage between a clinician and an engineer, for example. I, I won't ask which is which, and I'll leave that up to you to make your own mind. But like some marriages, I guess, the partnership also may produce and not last forever. At the core of this thesis, I guess, is that like men and women, even when they want to join in happy matrimony, there are some fundamental differences between engineers and clinicians that could get in the way of success and productivity. For successful partnerships, it's important that we understand and work with these differences. This afternoon we've hand-picked some very successful marriages. Each couple will take us through their experiences of the, the romance and the courtship, the ceremony perhaps, and eventually the rolling up their sleeves and getting down to work. The first of these couples I'd like to introduce relate to the Mona Lisa collaboration. I think Mona Lisa is, uh, is really an apt name for a discussion about marriage and, uh, and um, romance. My good friend, Dr. Henry Ho, a surgeon from Sing Health, he's a urologist, and uh, Henry is also the Vice Dean of Research for Surgery ACP, and head of the Medical Technology Office at Sing Health. He has important responsibilities within the healthcare organisation leading innovation, and he, he is an innovator himself. Henry will be joined by Dr Li Chi -tiong, Lim Chi Tiong, and Lim Chi Tiong himself is a researcher, come engineer, come CEO of a company. Uh, he is the engine room and the leader of Mona Lisa. Henry and, uh, and Chi Tiong, can I invite you both up on stage and, and tell us a bit about Mona Lisa? Sure. Right. So when we were introduced, I was uh, talking to Chi Tiong. I was wondering whether I should hold my hand <laughs> with him as we were introduced as a couple. <laughs> All right. So I, I will start off with the introduction, and I thought that uh, after lunch, it's going to be a bit difficult for me to be sitting down and talking. And I'll do a little bit of walkabouts. It's really good for my diet too. Um, really thank you so much, uh, Russell and uh, Yongju, to invite me to this session. Uh, and since it's a fireside chat, I thought I'll just walk around a little bit too. And I, I think there's a great possibility for me to share my journey. So my, my top, uh, title for the talk 
It is really to bring discovery to patients. Uh, all of you in this room uh, are either related to healthcare as a clinician, or you are a, the owner of a technology, or at the same time, you could be a facilitator of that journey. And all of us are here in this auditorium really to bring that journey to the patient. So I have intentionally uh, made that talk such a way that it's really to bring the journey to the patient. Do you have a clicker that I can use? Uh, yeah, that'd yeah. be nice. Thank you so Thank much. You. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. <laughs> the top, right. Right, so this is my disclaimer. Um, and, and the journey that I'm going to talk to you in the next 10 minutes is about this guy. So what you're looking right now here is the final product right now that is being marketed in all parts of the world, Australia, Germany, Italy. And this is the product that we're selling to many urologists in the world. Uh, but what is this journey? Well, I'm a urologist. Uh, I'm a robotic surgeon. I do uh, cancer surgery with a robot. With a robot. Well, it's a different robot. It's not the Mona Lisa robot. It's the Da Vinci robot. Uh, at the same time, I was sent to uh, one of the first scholars that goes to uh, Stanford to do the bar design program. And that was like nearly six years ago under the, scholar, uh, under the auspice of ASTAR. And this is the chairman of ASTAR with us when they're checking on us when we're at Stanford, making sure you don't spend too much time fun out there. Uh, this is the team. So we're talking about the team of engineers and clinicians. So you can see right in the front, you can see on the right side, that is Professor Chris Ching. And that's my mentor and the one that seeded the clinician idea of what we should be doing. And I'll tell you a little bit more. On the left is uh, Professor Weber Lau, another clinician. And you can see me there right in the middle who has a little bit more hair at that time. This picture was taken about nearly 10 years ago. <laughs> and around us, you can see the various engineer. And just behind Chris Ching is the late Professor Ng Wan Singh. He is the engine that actually pushes the entire group forward and he was the one that came up to us with this idea that can we do something that about robotics related for the diagnosis of uh, clinically significant prostate cancer. What is in front of it is the very first generation. I intentionally left the very latest version and what you see over there is the very first version that we had and there's a vast difference of what it is like. And I'm going to bring you through that journey of what we had over the last 10 years or more. And all of us actually went through this journey that everybody has right here. The despair and the ecstasy of the journey. All of us will be very excited. I have an idea. This is fantastic. It worked. Someone else care. No, it is not. The field it worked field. It's already patented. Everybody gets really sad about it. It goes down. We have a fix. We have a problem. For those of you who have started a journey before, I'm sure you know these are the journeys and ups and downs that you have in your emotion of the team. And it goes on and on until eventually, I hope we are here right now in the Mona Lisa that we are actually on the way up from all the way down and we continue to grow up. And this is the kind of journey that every one of you who wishes to bring your discovery to the patient, and this is how it will be and expect this journey to be the ups and downs. You will never be a trajectory that goes straight up to the top. So I'm going to focus back a little bit more to why this journey started. And for all of you who are not very familiar with the apologies for this picture, as a urologist, this is kind of a bread butter for me but I'd like to bring your attention to the prostate gland, just in case you don't really know where it is. It is something that is not only in men, it's just below the bladder, and this is something where it's important to produce uh, semen, and it's used to nourish the sperm during the, uh, in the reproductive years. But as you know, then prostate cancer is the number three cancer in the country. This is Singapore statistics, and it remains to be there for the last five years already, and it is going on, going to be there for the next many years to come. And therefore, I think it's a very important area. The clinical need that we have at that time was that the fact that we need to diagnose cancer, and the only way we can do that is by the transrectal approach. That means, like the picture I've said, it goes to the rectum. As you all know, the rectum is a, not the cleanest area. And you are supposed to take a tissue from a clean area through a dirty area, and therefore, you can imagine the risk of infection. And therefore, a 5% risk infection, in other words, it means that one out of 20 patients will have infection that requires him to be admitted because of a diagnostic procedure. These are patients who have not been diagnosed with cancers. They are just coming men on the street who say that I have an abnormal test and in the, in the process of the diagnosis, I get sepsis out of it. 
These are not men with princes. And therefore, this is really a diagnostic too. And we feel at a time, when I was a resident at the time, I'll be thinking, well, what are the other ways that I can do to avoid the infection rate of 5%? That is 1 in 20. In other words, if there's so many of you here, roughly about 10 of you will get sepsis from the process of diagnosing your problem. So I have discovered that there are really three ways to do that. One is to the rectum, which everybody is doing. Two is to go through the perineum, is the area between the anus and the scrotum. Thirdly, is to go through the urethra. So why are people not doing it that way? So that's the reason why I went through the journey of finding out myself why people do not want to do it. And realize that the perineum is actually a good place to take. It actually goes to the ader over there and take pieces of tissue from there and therefore the risk of infection is nearly zero. In fact, we've done right now more than a thousand patients and we had only one infection. That is 0.001% risk of infection. So we've decided that in order to avoid having the transperineal way of multiple puncture, we've decided that if we can go through two little punctures, and that can allow us to achieve the same amount of coverage of the prostate gland at the same time. So we decided and we started a journey and at that time we have to get, there is no A star BP grant at that time. <laughs> at that time we do not have, that is 2005 period. We have to go to MNRC and we have to masquerade ourselves as a very basic science project. I still remember the project title when the like, accurate positioning of the needle in the prostate gland. So we got a, it's really not very scientific or basic science, but we got our first grant, all right? This is about $200,000 at the time. And we got it, and this is how it looks like at the time. It looks like an artillery system. It is man, it has a gantry over there, it has an ultrasound probe in white over there, and it has a positioning system over there, and we actually have to click the clicks, or two to the right, three to the left, more to the forward, it's really like an artillery system at that time. It looks horrible. You can see the bare naked skeleton around that. And we went on to, at the time to do some animal trials with that money. This is Dr. John Yuan there in the foreground. And you can see there, there's an animal there, and that is a dog. Interestingly, for you who are not familiar with animal trials, only dogs have prostate. And not all dogs, obviously. Only male dogs have prostate. <laughs> <laughs> and clearly not every male dogs have prostate because we need male old dogs to have prostate. So as a result of that, it was so difficult to find male old dogs to do that. Because for most male old dogs, they are well loved by their pet owners. So they will never allow them to be sacrificed in this way. So that's the reason why a lot of times we actually have to go to Malaysia. There's a lot of stray dogs over there. And this is one of the first trials that we did. And you can see that the John Rian, we do, we can see the positioning. There's, you can see Mona Lisa now there, the first version. In fact, those days we do call it Mona Lisa. It's G1 at the time. And this is how it looks like. We do that with the X-ray. We actually went on to do the gantry, like I said, the artery system. And that's what we did. And we went on to do cadaver trials at the time. So this is the first few cadaver trials with the same money that we had. And this is a cadaver trial that we had. And this is how the x-ray looked like. You can see the needle tip. And we intentionally left a target seat inside there to kind of use that as a marker to see how far are we away from that biopsy. And this is one of the reasons why we asked for that money for NMRC to do that. Very successful, very happy. We're all extremely happy. And this is how we celebrated. There's Prof Cheng there with uh, Dr. Ng Wan Singh. We're celebrating. The reason why we're celebrating is because we actually got another grant from the TEC in 2006. The TEC grant is really when all the time in 2007 period, we realized the economy is very bad. So we actually have to go down to the Prime Minister's office to ask for money. If not, the team is going to be disbanded at the time. So if you look at the timeline of the emotions, we are in despair really right now. And they gave us $200,000 at the time. It was really, really rain to the desert. And that was then, we went on to do the next version. And so away from the artillery system, now we look like Harley Davidson. All right, <laughs> so this is how it looks like. And this is a version two at the time. And we went on to do, we did trial in 2006. We get the RRB to do the first in men in 2006 period. So that was a time we started out with a few patients at the time with the RRB and we did it in the Singapore General Hospital. 
At the time, after three years, we actually went on to patent the system together with NTU. And this is where I would like to move on to the next phase of the journey where we are really done with the academic journey between NTU and SingHealth and we move on to the commercial part of Mona Lisa journey. And with that, I just want to pass the mic over to my partner, or my bromance brother, <laughs> to Chi Tiong, to continue the rest of the journey. Chi Tiong, thanks. Thanks, uh, Prof. Russell, Dr. Lo, and also Henry for asking to me. Somehow, I guess, I, if some of you know, somehow know me and Henry, we just, I don't know why we always bump into each other. Uh, through when we're in Sing Health Times and when I'm in Zcoms, I got involved in the BioBot project as well. So here today, I'm, I'm here representing BioBot and Zcom to uh, support Henry in this journey. Um, the slides, it's the same slides actually, if you don't mind. So moving on, what happens from there is Zcom came in uh, when they spin off and we actually uh, invested into the company and we licensed uh, IP from NTU and Sing Health. Um, unfortunately, at the time, uh, Prof. Uh, Ng Wan Singh actually passed away shortly after. And our chairman, uh, Mr. J. L. Sim, made a promise and said that we will continue to support this company and to bring it over to fruition. So, and you could see that uh, in 2010, we did an academic launch. And in 2011, we have an FDA approval. And we are quite happy also in 2012 to get a C mark. So at the moment, uh, we do have FDA, CE, TGA, HSA, and I'll show you a bit later. So this is in 2013, when they went to AUA, which is the largest uh, urological congress in, in US uh, every year, to do this commercial launch. And we thought, this is it, right? Launch, regulatory approved, we are very happy. But uh, the, the journey actually has just began. And I'm not even really talking about the commercial part, which I think today we want to focus more towards the collaboration. Um, but what we did was we realized that even though when we started off having a lot of clinical studies with uh, SGH at the time, but as a company, we realized that we have, um, when we wanted to push this system out, every country will have slightly different practices. That's one. And every different hospital will have different, slightly different accessories that they use. So for example, um, in terms of the ultrasound that we use, so there needs to be some hardware changes. In terms of the different practices, there needs to be some software modification. So it was not all that smooth from commercial all the way, and it was really difficult. But at the same time, we always have to go back to SGH, and they have been very great help to us. So even though while we started engaging all the different institutes, be it uh, Mayo or be it in Germany or in UK, we will always come back to SGH for them to lead any multi-center studies. And having them, the doctors, working with us, really um, help us in uh, pushing this through. So right now, as you can see, just a quick show in this case that we have all the different regulatory approvals. And this is an example of some of the hospitals that have been using it or have trialed it. And actually, this list goes on. Uh, it's it probably has increased another 50%. And it increases every month, and we are quite happy about it. And we are also featured in international news, and you could see news in Australia, in Singapore, in Germany, in the US, and also in Italy. So I wouldn't take up too much time uh, for this, and I will end this session now with uh, pass it over to Prof. Russell. Thanks, Jim. Great. So we want your questions to come through. So, yes. uh, yeah. Yongju, can you explain okay. the process and how to use this? Have all of you uh, downloaded the MySpad app? Yeah. If not, please uh, go to Google Play Store or the, and uh, I mean, iPhone Store, and please download the app. Then any questions, please uh, put forth so that we can take a look over here. So, yeah. so it's an easy find. Is that the? Uh, yes, it's quite easy to find. And uh, once you download the app, I mean, you just it, in the way you just have to put in your email address. Then you can go into the app itself. Then there will be. Then you go to the. Top left hand corner, there is a Q&A session where you can put your questions. So put your questions into the Q&A. They'll come to us and uh, be part of the conversation. Yep. Can I go right back to perhaps the start of the relationship? How did you guys meet? Getting a bit emotional here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
I, I still, I, I did not meet Chi Tiong at that time, <laughs> but what happened at the time in truth was that uh, Dr. Ng Wan Sing, or rather Professor Ng Wan Sing at that time, he was very curious of trying to deal with prostate enlargement. He came to the hospital and he was looking for urologists to help him to do a robotic, what we call a TRP or TERP, which is really to remove the prostate enlargement part of the prostate gland. But I think, so I still remember uh, Prof Cheng t telling me that, uh, you know, if you do that, you're making the urologist running out of job. <laughs> Nobody's going to like you in the hospital ground. <laughs> so that's when the, he said that, why don't you think about something else, that this is an area that increasingly will be important. And that's why we actually embarked on the journey. And that's how they met, actually, actually for a wrong reason. And it was re-guided again back to what we have started from Mona Lisa. Mm. Yeah. It sounds like um, he was a real mentor to you. And, uh, and we all know how important that is in, in medicine and surgery. Mm -hmm. yeah. Henry, when, when did you know that you wanted to be an innovator? Wow, okay. <laughs> Definitely not when I woke up one day in the morning. <laughs> uh, I, I think one of the key things uh, is uh, definitely the journey itself uh, through Mona Lisa uh, has ha definitely helped me to kind of consolidate the thought of being a clinician, uh, what else can I be? Uh, I think a lot of time uh, being a clinician is one of like the basic uh, tenets of what every doctor should be. In fact, every nurse, physiotherapist can do that too. But really... Can you help in a much bigger quantum jump? I think that's the key question that most people would like to ask yourself uh, and say that other than being the way that you're treating patients by the one-to-one -one relationship they have as a doctor, surgeon, nurse or physiotherapy, but is there any other way they can change the way healthcare is being delivered, which is the theme of today, of course. Uh, I think that is one of the key driving force for me. Um, in fact, uh, when I finished uh, with uh, Mona Lisa uh, in 2009, at the time, uh, I, that's the time when the uh, Singapore Stanford Biodesign Program came around in 2010. And I was already a consultant, I was uh, attending at the time. I was thinking that is a big jump for me to sacrifice uh, my clinical career and go for this uh, innovation task. But what drives me to take up that was the fact that if I'm able to go to Stanford, to minimize that despair and ecstasy journey like a stock market, can I have it more consistently upstream? And that was something that drives me to say that I want to learn a methodology that permits me to make sure this, this ups and downs like the ECG kind of uh, uh, emotions in any innovating team can be minimized and keep it a little bit more predictable and, and definitely much better. And that was the driving force why I have a major opportunity course of, to my clinical career and went on to do a year in Stanford under the auspice of A-Star, which is really a game life-changing uh, event for me. Yeah. Yeah. Young, uh, yeah, did, um, was Henry the first clinician you had actually worked with? Well, I mean, um, I met Henry actually when I was working at Zing Health at the time and we shared the same passion. Um, so he's not one of the first that I worked together, incidentally, because at the time when we were in Sing Health, we were working together to set up the uh, Medtech office. And we were always reaching out to different clinicians to, uh, to support them. So actually, I've never even talked about BioBot when I was uh, in, in Sing Health at that time. Um, and we definitely worked together to, and especially he showed me a lot in what are the psyche of different clinicians. And that's how, when, during my time in Sing Health, I could actually help to uh, arrange quite a few uh, projects for the clinicians and also to link up between the universities and also the industry. So what were the key things about the psyche of the clinicians and being able to start projects? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, actually it's not that difficult uh, when you think about it. Um, in fact, I was just joking to Henry, although today the... The team was supposed to be engineers are from Mars, clinicians are from Venus, but I'll add on to say that, but they all have to go back to Earth to get married or to set up the family. <laughs> so going back to Earth is going back to reality. To set up a family is at the end of the day, what do you want to achieve together? 
So clinicians that I find out, um, there are a few things. I mean, first and foremost, they care for the patients a lot. Uh, and so when we work with them, it's always, we, we need to make sure, first and foremost, this part, uh, whatever innovations that we have, is able to do that. But very quickly, sometimes we'll ask them, for example, if uh, there are some doctors who have certain disease or certain treatment, and we'll ask, how many of such patients do you see in a year? He'll say, five. And we'll say, okay, we can still do something. You can't make it commercialized, but if you can come out with a prototype and you can get a, a, a donor or philanthropy money to build hundreds of these uh, small little uh, devices that can help you uh, save the patients and help the patients for years, that works too. So sometimes it's not all about making commercial success, mm -hmm. but what doctors want to do is to help them uh, help the patients, and we find ways to do it to help them. It's not always about commercialization. Yeah. Interesting. So thank you for the questions coming through. Thank we'll you. Keep them coming. There's a couple here about the name. Oh, Why is it called Mona Lisa? What has Mona Lisa got to do with a prostate? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, All right. Question, yeah. So actually, Mona Lisa is a diagnostic tool. Um, so do you know the, the biggest robotic company in the world right now, of course, is Intuitive Surgicals. And, and they make the most important robot right now. It's called a Da Vinci. So that is a treatment robot. So in order to have a perfect marriage in terms of continuum of the care of the patient from the diagnosis of the prostate cancer to the treatment of the prostate cancer, we've intentionally positioned ourselves to be the before Da Vinci, you will always think about Mona Lisa. So that's how it is like. Oh, <laughs> On that note, we'll come back to some of the questions uh, a little bit later in the session. Thank you both for your presentation. I wonder if we could... I ask you to move across two seats. Okay. Yongju, over to you. I'm going to go on to talk about the second marriage, which is the Enomaster collaboration. Professor Lawrence Ho and Mr. Colin Tan will share their experiences in taking a challenging medical robotics project from research to a well-funded project uh, um, startup. Based on their work to create a robotic uh, surgical system for removing gastrointestinal cancers without incision, yeah. They will share the importance, challenges and rewards of collaborating with all the stakeholders in the project, mainly clinical, business and engineering. Before uh, I invite Prof. Uh, Ronso, um, basically he's also internationally recognized key opinion leader in gastroenterology and GI endoscopy. Besides, his, as a clinician, he's also a vice dean for research at Yong Luling School of Medicine and currently the group director of research office in National University Health System. Professor Ho, please. Thanks, thanks a lot for this kind invitation. So I think uh, it's quite similar. We are going to talk, talk to you uh, briefly about the, uh, the Endomaster uh, project, which is um, also a robotic uh, project, uh, which is subsequently spin off as a startup company. So once they get a slide, I'll go through my own journey. Uh, Louis, unfortunately, uh, is not able to be here. So, but anyway, the marriage continues into the, into the startup company. So I think uh, you can see that this is the Endomaster uh, collaboration. And um, this is something which is um, important because um, I think uh, the journey started quite some time ago at a time when uh, innovation and enterprise was not as much uh, value as it is now and for a good reason. So during that time, I think we sort of went through the entire journey of eyes, uh, which started obviously with some issues. So similar to, to uh, Henry's uh, case, I think, again, it was an engineer who came to us. But again, I think uh, as many people here have already encountered, when engineers come up with something, they are very passionate about their products, about their skills. And uh, some of the times, I think, uh, this, all this, uh, these ideas may not fit into our issue. That's where I think uh, we have to somehow, as clinicians, as users, we have to 
uh, spin a so, sort of a story to fit into an issue. So I think our issue at that time, when he came to me, is he has a, a wonderful robot. He has this skill to do all sorts of things. And then he asked me for the need. And then I'm a gastroenterologist and endoscopy. Obviously, I'm biased. So that's where we sort of uh, very much uh, focus upon resection from internal side. If we can click onto, I can't click it here. If you can click onto the video, or maybe I can go there. It's OK. Thanks. <coughs> So I think uh, anyway, so if you look at uh, this, six, this is a resection from uh, within the stomach for early gastric cancer. It's a quite a big cancer. So when we do this sort of thing, we have to virtually put a scope in, and then after that, try to cut the thing, uh, try to cut the thing endoscopically using just one arm, essentially, to try to resect it. Because the moment if you cut it a bit more, Callously, you can perforate through because the wall is only three millimeter, and each wall is one millimeter. So you are only going to peel off one millimeter. So this is where um, I think the challenge is compared with surgeon like Russell Green. I think the surgeons are, I would say that they are Western cultured. They always know that you have two arms and you need to do things using two arms. So that's where I think the way of eating is actually <laughs> the fork and the, the, the spoon, uh, the knife and the fork. So they are very simple people. <laughs> oh. <laughs> nothing, nothing very special. What's the endoscopy is, we have I to... I can do it too, look. <laughs> Yeah, the endoscopy has to fit into the natural anatomy because you have to, you have to actually remember inside the body, we do not have all our senses. We cannot see, we cannot smell, we cannot hear. These are all the diagnostic senses we use when we make diagnosis uh, in, during our clinical examination. So I think endoscopies can only put in things. So endoscopy is actually a camera we put in as a surrogate for a pair of eyes, nothing extra, okay? So if you can't see, you can't, cannot make a diagnosis. But then along the way, they say, that's not good enough. We have to do something. We have to use our hands. So I think the closest they can do is, how do we put our hands? They say, okay, well, maybe we'll try to, like <laughs> Russell say, we put in two and then try to do something. But again, one actually converting to two is actually very tough. So this is where the challenge is. Can you actually then convert one arm into two arms so that you can behave exactly as a simple-minded surgeon, just using two arms? Actually, physically, it's not possible because you have to enter somehow. You have to enter through only what we call the natural pathways, such as the, from the mouth or from the anus. Very few other places you can enter in order for you to have a free sort of uh, uh, space to, to do your procedures and to fix the issues encountered by the patient. So this is where I think uh, when the, this uh, Luis came to me with this robotic skills, he asked me, what exactly do you need? I think uh, I did not know how to answer, but then I said that I just want to be a surgeon like Russell <laughs> to become more simple. So I think then, then that's uh, where it started the, the journey. We want to do exactly as two arms. So I think that then the idea came that uh, perhaps the robot can actually help to move away from just games. This is something uh, just, in, just very incidental at the time when it came to me is uh, I actually happened to watch the Robot Cup documentary in a hotel during one of my conference uh, spare times. So I was amazed at how good Singaporean robots a robotic engineers were. So when he came to me, I thought, wow, it's good. He must be very good. Because you know why at the time they showed the documentary, Singapore was actually world number one in RoboCup. Okay, these are actually uh, college students from MYP to Marseille and Yian and so forth. They actually went into the top eight and then after that went into the semi final and finally after a few years, they were world champion. So I think that gave me a story. I said there's no way Singaporean can be World Cup champion, no matter how hard they try. 
Okay, but we can be robot, robot cup champion. So I think, so I think robot, we, we don't have to be a world expert. My point is, I do not have to be a world expert endoscopies. But if I just try to use a the technology, there's a chance I can be a world expert endoscopies because we simply is too small. So that's where we sort of say, okay, we'll go into the partnership, we'll work hard and so forth and try to create something which is useful. And then it started with this, this kind of story. We tried, failed, could not get the prototype working. And the reason is we were very ambitious. So we thought about putting the entire shoulders, wrists, uh, elbows, everything in as if we were a surgeon. And then the thing proved to be too technically challenged. Ch uh, challenging. So finally, I think one day this guy, Sidney Chung, who is down there, he came and visited. So I told Luis, he's a brilliant guy, must get him to out. So we got him out. That was during just after the SARS. So he stepped down as a dean of Hong Kong uh, Chinese University because of the SARS incident. He gave up. He went to Papua New Guinea, <laughs> completely shut off from the rest of the world because of extreme disappointment with what happened during that time. So I think when he heard about this story, his eyes sparkled. So I said, Luis, he, he's very interested. He's a guy with few words. If he's so interested, there's something. So it helped us to refashion why we fail. And then the rest is history. So he put this, this thing, his uh, idea into the napkin. And then he said, keep this napkin. One day you'll become famous. So that's a crap cross story. And then indeed, I think we converted the whole thing into the blueprint. And then subsequently, I think that's a, the, the sort of... Uh, it's a robotic endoscope. Yeah. So, so subsequently, this is the, the sort of thing we, we put into picture. So the whole robotic arms could go into the scope. And then we can operate from outside. The master could operate. And then we can do all this uh, procedure as if you're a surgeon. So I think that uh, sort of is the sort of idea, there are two people operating as if you have a team of surgeons. And then with that, we went on, of course, to prove that this actually works. Because I think prototype is prototype, um, and, um, but real world is a different thing. So I think we started doing a lot of animal experiments, and uh, we call this master and slave, a transluminal endoscopy robot, master. And then subsequently, we, our company is also called Endomaster. I think the investigations proved to be very challenging. And the most challenging part is actually the clinical trial because this is one of the first few therapeutic agents and it's very extremely high risk. So we couldn't get anywhere close, could not get regulatory clearance for anybody to do it. So finally, I think I must thank NTU, took the plunge and bless us to just do it. So I think the ethics were obtained through NTU and then anyone who gave us the ethic clearance, we do it. And then finally, we actually have to go outside the country. In retrospect, this proved to be good because those are the surgeons from overseas who actually did the first for us. And they were actually, uh, in some ways, if we say we are good, people say we are biased. If other people say you are good, you must be good. So they say we are good. And then they did it for us in live demo unprepared, and they did it. So because of that reasons, we, we succeeded. So I think I'll just maybe re-click it. So I think we succeeded to do the worst, worst first, uh, uh, let me just see. Okay, so I think essentially this is just two arms and one will do the grasping, still exposure and so forth, and the other one will be the operating. This is a surgeon from uh, Hong Kong uh, then myself on the other side. So we are doing it live in front of big audience during their uh, annual uh, endoscopy workshop. So I'm prepared, real case. So I think after that, I think uh, that's a cancer remove. And then we got this big editorial from a very reputable journal, Tier 1, and written by the American uh, all these, uh, Society presidents. And then they say this is a small case series but a giant step for endoscopy. And then after that, that's the beginning of a new era. So I think with that, definitely, I think after that, after our initial success now, there are other people who are following us. I think there are other flexible endoscopy robots coming out very quickly after us. But I think we had a head start five years. So we decided that 
we have to spin off. Otherwise, we were too slow. I must say that I think in the academic world, things move very slowly. I think we all experience. There's no, I think this is an open secret because of the cultural differences and so forth. So I think when, one, once you know that this idea is world class, you have to go fast because time becomes important. So I think no other, no other way around apart from speeding off. Otherwise, we'll lose out. So that's where I think we made the, the decision uh, to do it. And then with time, of course, we realized the impact came out later. It, doesn't, it didn't come out the, the initially. So we knew that I think uh, we could potentially use it to reduce learning curve, which we show in the in a study again done with the Japanese endoscopies. We didn't do it ourselves again because of conflict. Once you have a company, there's a conflict involved. Mm. So you get those Japanese to do it for you. And then they show that between the experts and the non-experts, and then they could do it. And then also, I think we show that we can reduce certain complications such as bleeding. And uh, hopefully this video will play. <clears throat> Maybe I'll stop this one and then replay it. Sorry, go back. Okay, so this is about uh, stopping the bleeding. This is a newer pro prototype uh, where we lift up and then after that we cut it. So when, you, it, when we encounter a bleeding, we could use one of the arms to actually coagulate and stop the bleeding. Okay. So I think uh, with this sort of thing, at least you can have two arms to stabilize. You could take your sweet time and not to encounter the one millimeter margin which you can perforate. Okay. The next one is hopefully the video again will play. I'll go back again, let it warm up. Okay, so I think this is what we are hoping to do eventually, doing suturing using the robots, when there's no other way of doing it now currently, based on current technology, because you are one arm. Okay, so we are hoping that, I think now that we have two arms, you can do all this, and then closer and closer towards what we call natural orifice surgery, which is what? We can just sound it. Electrocauterizer cuts through the tissue at the desired plane. We can cut off the sound. Okay, so I think we are hoping eventually the robots can then go through the stomach wall and into the peritoneum and then do the abdominal surgery. That's the last frontier we are hoping to do. Okay, so I think that will seal the thing that the difference between surgeons and physicians will be reduced. Okay, so I think with that, I'm going to stop, pause here and ask perhaps I think Colin to just comment about the very important part which is uh, how do we sustain the momentum with the injection of money. Okay, hello. Okay, hey, thanks, Prof. Okay, hi, everyone. So, um, just introduction. My name is Colin Tan. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Endomaster. So, just to give you an idea, so Prof has, Prof has really given a nice idea about uh, a, nice, a nice story about how they started from research into commercialization, uh, into a startup company. So, uh, when Prof Ho and actually uh, Prof Fee approached me actually, I'm actually employee number one in Endomaster. We have about over 20 people now, but uh, they came to me with this story, a bit like what, what you've seen here. And what actually uh, inspired me uh, to join this group is because actually I felt well, two things. I think, I think they both had a lot of grit and belief in the product they wanted to do. And I think the product was very interesting. So I thought, you know, um, just give it a try and see how it goes. And I think uh, never look back. Um, but I think what's really interesting about this product is that uh, we all firmly believe that it really changed the way that surgery is done. So I don't know if it's clear or not from the videos, but imagine now you just don't have to go for any kind of uh, open or laparoscopic surgery. As you can do things endoluminally. Nobody wants to go for a major kind of surgery, right? Everyone wants to go to a less invasive, cheaper, faster, better kind of surgery. So I really think this is really something that's going to change things. So now back to this in terms of um, the research and the work that they got up to. Um, I think from that point, Profo is right. Um, from a research setting, when they had a good product, they did good clinical trials, uh, when it was time to spin it out, I think they did a very interesting thing where they said, okay, we're actually gonna give it to people in, who know what to do in industry. I think both the professors are very good in terms of medicine, uh, academia, robotics research. I think they're fantastic in that. But when it comes to industry, it's, a, it's, it's actually a different ball game. You have to worry about your R&D development. Medical devices is very regulated. You have your uh, regulations and your quality and your planning a proper clinical trial and even the, even the marketing and sales. So I think they did the right thing in terms of partnering with people from outside. So my background is actually in industry as well. I think that's why they got me in. Um, so I think that was uh, um, how it started out. And I think through that collaboration, that's where we initially got our initial funding to get the project started, and then the company started that way. 
But kind of relating back to the topic that we're talking about in terms of this marriage between uh, engineering and, and medicine, I mean, I think what I want to say about that is that uh, it actually never ends. I think a lot of people always think that, yeah, once you're done with academia, you kind of give it to the industry guys and off they go and do their thing and I can go back to you know, my office and to my practice or whatever, whatever it is I'm doing. Um, my, my opinion actually is very, very important. Um, Profo has actually been very, very helpful in helping us, even when we meet with investors or even when we are uh, in conferences, medical conferences. Actually, the, the collaboration with doctors actually, I think, is a very, very key success to, to where we've gotten today. Uh, we definitely couldn't do it without uh, his support and even with Profi's support at NTU. So I think if there's any key message to take away, because I know it's, it's all after lunch, we're all sleepy and everything. Um, the key message here is really about, from my side, it's really about uh, you should continue to continue your collaborations, like, even when you spin it out. I know maybe most of you here are in academia and stuff, but when you, when you work with your industry people, always stay involved um, and, and, and keep that collaboration open, because it, it really never ends. So I think that's a very important part of, of what we've gotten today. Um, and then I'll speak, I mean, this, this part is supposed to talk about investment. And uh, investment are actually two things that are very important. Um, naturally, when you think about investment, you think about money, but technically investment to me is two things. You're also investing time. So yeah, sure, for investment, you get your investors to come in and get them to believe in your product, your vision, uh, your team, and then they invest money in the project. Um, I think a lot of that is due to the good work that we've done here at Endomaster, whether you're in uh, uh, academia or medicine or industry. Um, but I think the other part is also the investment in time. There really has to be a lot of um, commitment and investment in time to do this, whether it was from Profo's team or uh, the Endomaster team here. So, and, and that comes back to really believing in the product and believing the team, that the, the, the effort that was put together. So I think that was, to me, one of the key successes of why Endomaster is still moving forward very quickly. Um, you know, just to give you the sort of the roundabout story in terms of Endomaster. So for us, we, we've gotten to the point where we are really at the tail end of our R&D. So it's actually a really exciting time for us. We're actually going to be launching the product in about, say, about a year and a half already. We're quite close to actually getting our European approval. Um, like you saw in the BioBot, they've actually gotten a lot further ahead because they've started a lot earlier. And so it's a different product altogether, actually. Um, but we will get to those stages as well. So it's, so it's actually quite an exciting thing. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm going to say about that, and I'll leave it to questions. All right. So, um, Prof Ho, yeah, you're already so busy as a clinician, so where do you get this extra drive, I mean just to sort of inspire some of the clinicians over here, to be an innovator, to sort of spend extra time and effort in doing this? Yeah. So I think we're all busy. Right? I think it's a question of priorities and so forth, and also I think the purpose in what we do. Right? I think uh, similar to many of us uh, clinicians, I think we tend to, we derive a lot of personal satisfaction through seeing patients, through our skills and so forth. But on the other hand, after a while, you see that, well, how much can you actually do? I think if you have the, the aspiration to be world class, you've got to think there's no chance you can be world class just by doing the same thing after and after. Sometimes I look at my own scopes. I've already tried my best. Each time, I attend a lot of workshops, invited to workshops. But after a while, you say, so what? You still are limited. Because how much can the scope take you further? You see, a lot of people, I think why, I think talking about innovators, we cannot be innovators because we hold on to our skills too much. We are overvalued for our skills. Similar to a soldier's overvalue for something, the martial arts people overvalue for the kung fu and everything, so they don't want to jump. They do not want to jump to the next step, which is get rid of them. So I think we have to have a mindset, how do we actually make us go to the next step? I think it's not to, f not to keep valuing our skills. We've got to think about what's the outcome. After all, you say the patients, do they want us to do all those things again? I don't think so. They want a simple tool which can solve their problem, not so much whether you are skillful, whether you are not, just solve their problem. So I think increasingly, I, I, my own way of seeing that innovator is simple. Just forget about your skills and go back to basic and think about the questions and then after that go forward. That's where the martial arts went into weapons. It's the same thing where the horses went into cars and then after that the planes came ships came all came together and it's a it's a simple concept that you do not need this sort of skills which are, has a physical limits well also i think a lot of technologies do not have limits you can actually jump to the next dimension so i think with that of course i say that i can spend all the time of, in, in the world yes. 
to do all this, but there's a limit. You see? So I, I'd rather spend some time thinking about other things and then working with people, the engineers, Colin and so forth. I think it's a much... I hope I, I, I make some sense <laughs> to, the, to the people here. <laughs> Thanks. So Colin, besides the support of the clinicians and also maybe funders, what do you think are the other partners that's essential to keep this momentum going? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I, I, I think like I was trying to say just now, it's, it's, it's really a team effort. La. I mean, the, the clinician obviously is a very, very important part of the company. But I think you also have to look at um, the people in the industry, um, for example, people who are, in, who are experts in the regulatory area, how to conduct an industry clinical trial. Um, how to do your marketing and sales. Um, you know, it's, it, it can sound quite daunting, but you do actually have to plan all these things out uh, early on. I mean, I'm sure you've all heard of something called a business plan, but it's, and, and it's usually a very thick document, but you know, whether it's thick or thin, it's, it's really about planning out what you need to do to get this to the market. And you will, have, you will find naturally that you have to get these different levels of expertise, whether it's your entrepreneur leader, your, your doctor, your regulatory person, or your R&D expert. I mean, all these people have to, have to be in place. Um, and then only then I feel you'd be in a good position to uh, get your product to market. Okay, thanks. I think you all realize that there is an empty seat here. Last but not least, uh, let's invite Mr. Pit, uh, Philip Lim. He is the CEO of ETPL, a star commercialization company since December 2009. He has led the company in performance outcomes that exceeds world benchmarks, especially in licensing agreements and startups. Uh, form. Mr. Lim is also instrumental in introducing several innovations and productization initiatives such as Diagnostics Development Hub and the A-Start Central Incubation. Mr. Philip Lim, please. Thank you. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, uh, and I really appreciate this opportunity to be here. And an opportunity to be, I think the best way to describe it, you have two couples, one on my left, one on my right, so I'm going to be the So lamp post, I suppose the only beautiful thing that you could do is maybe provide a little bit of uh, overview to uh, what uh, is really going on here. And um, so this is really my perspective of uh, having struggled with uh, commercialization, great technologies, great ideas, and how to bring them forward into the market. Now, uh, and I think uh, they have uh, establish this and share this in many ways, but uh, I think there are three distinct stages if I could just oversimplify things a little bit. Yes, what Henry called the struggle and the struggle and the ups and downs the, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, the initial stage is one of what we call maybe ideation. The idea, but the idea starts with problem statements. I think identifying the problem itself, it's a huge, complex process because you identify the problem wrongly almost every time, but only through a lot of iteration of exactly what you're trying to solve um, and how do you solve it, how do you get there. Um, I don't think I want to try to uh, repeat what Henry said, but he kind of like came down to three different approaches. Um, so yes, that's one way of doing it, but then where is the, 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 the solution? Then, I think there is a process of then trying out different options, uh, and this time with the engineer who can say, well, we can make this happen, we can't make that happen. This one, we can, but a lot of risk is on implications and so on. And then at the end, actually try it out through some kind of a prototyping, some kind of a mock-up, some kind of a well, let's get going, whether you end up getting it you or know, finding a dog to do it or, or screen on or whatever it is. But I think that's part of the uh, ideation and prototyping uh, stage. Now, one significant thing that we have done here, uh, together with the folks at the TTSH, uh, is uh, I think what's going on right now, uh, open innovation uh, challenge in healthcare. Uh, again, it took them a long time to just get clinicians, senior clinicians, to agree on problem statements. What is really irritating out there? What would really make a difference uh, in their clinical practice? And it came down to about 18 problem statements. It took them several months just to agree on that 18 statement, which is a significant step. I'm sure it's a feat in some way, but it is a significant and important step. This is then presented to the people in the uh, uh, innovation spaces, uh, the actually more the, uh, the investors, 
uh, people in uh, the, the universities, uh, A star, and also people in the industry. So let's not pretend that all the ideas are in the universities and in A star. There are a lot of great ideas out there, people who have been there, done it out there in the industries, and it's 18 problems who also presented to them. I understand that 42 proposals came forward. It took a long time as well for them to understand the problem and then iterate the ideas and all that. 42 problems came up. Possible solutions to proposals came forward. At the end, I think we're looking at about a dozen. And I think just last week, in A star, we looked at some of the proposals from A star. There were eight or, or, or nine uh, credible proposals, which I think uh, the uh, commercial people looked at and say, in terms of chance, you can try. Um, and through their proposals, we came up to just four. Right? So I don't know, out of 18 possible problem statements, looks like we're addressing four. Uh, uh, a bit of a disappointment in there, but I think these are the ones with the place. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, private sector, the SME came up with some proposals, backed up by Spring. I can't remember the, the, the actual number, but in the process, probably there will be some other overlapping uh, proposals to them, and these has got uh, some potential going forward. But whatever that is, it still requires to go into a prototype, um, some animal trials, or whatever it is, before can decide if it is worth the next step. And the next stage is a product ideation stage. It is my proposal, my suggestion, that in the whole order of, thing, of, of things, in the whole scheme of things, that should be seen as a significantly different stage and curated by a different group of people. So that there is a clear stage dating and a kind of a selection process. Right? And if you guys thought four great ideas, you know, the panel of you and the EPL and the ASAR panels or whatever it is in the position, but you after you all decided to get, you know, to bed already, and you think you've got the best idea, whatever it is. But before it goes to the next significant uh, investment, say, it must be a different group of people, completely different set of eyes, and this guy comes in and, what is the problem statement again? Where is the market in this and who would pay money for this? Is it just that hospital, you and your buddies in PTSH, or the, all Singapore hospitals and all the surgeons and the urologists will be excited about this? What about urologists in China, in Vietnam, in Philippines, in the US? Would they be excited about this? Different set of lenses, different pair of eyes coming in, different set of criteria and all those. So, and we have, and they have kind of figured out and convinced themselves that this is worth going forward with, then it is significant money in taking through. Well, now let's get the refinement. Uh, he started with artillery piece into um, uh, what was the second? Harley Davidson. Okay, that's pretty cool, right? But um, yes, uh, uh, does it look like you know, some new Apple iPhone or kind of thing? People are too up for it or something. Different pair of eyes, different set of people coming in to take a look at it, uh, which then takes it into clinical trials. These are real human trials right now, which is again not a trivial process. You got the IRBs, you got the, mm. uh, the, the, the various uh, uh, ethical groups and CE mark regulators and all this that you need to consult. So they need to be brought in, they need to get comfortable with the idea. You don't wait until you are done with the source set of regulatory approval and give them a call. Now. You speak to them, show them the design, show them the rules. Show them the data that you have created and the data that you are still collecting. And then they will say, Why do you collect more data in this area? I need human trials, I need different groups of patients, different ethnic groups, or whatever it is. They will tell you early and, and you have to do it. And you do it in a way that meets their ISO standards, maybe not ISO, but their regulatory standards, the collection of data and all this kind of thing. Otherwise, you have to repeat everything all over again, which I promise you is going to be very, very difficult. So, in short, Productization is an area of specialty. You need, you know, experts who have been there, done it, and been uh, gone through those journeys many times before. Yes, folks from uh, uh, Zikon uh, who has done some of these things is looking at it. They can repeat that expertise. Uh, they can give the advisory. They can tell you whether this is worth your investment. Uh, and yes. You want the productizers not just to just come and give advisory, but you want them to put skin in the game. What is your investment at this stage? 
Uh, maybe they'll be backing the co-investment from the public sector, but I think that's another discussion on how to lubricate this to make this a stage that can be repeatable, that is pervasive, that will always be there. And the last stage is the most important stage in my mind. Um, yes, it is the industrialization, commercialization, what I call the industry development. You have one great idea, it is very painful to push through that idea step by step, but that's essentially what it is, push. We need some help on the other end, suction power. We want industry and industry cluster that is fairly mature, at least a buzz, and things are moving there, so that they create a pull factor to all these things that are bubbling and going on. What do I mean by industry cluster? You need players out there who are ready to take product after product migration simplification into markets. They know the markets, they've developed the markets before, they understand what's going on, how to get into Vietnam, India, China, whatever it is, and get the products to the business. When these guys start talking, the investors get interested. Investors, you can talk to them many, many times. I'm sure you know, Lawrence has done about a hundred of these meetings and all these kind of things, and he can tell you how easy those meetings have gone, right? But um, if they understand um, our process and our capabilities and our ecosystem, they will be hunting around here. When there are more of them hunting in this zone, there are more things that they can pick and more things can flow outwards. So we need to develop a cluster of these people and not just individuals one by one on, a, uh, on an ad hoc basis. Um, so we need a crowd of them. And the way to do this, well, chicken or the egg. When these guys are there, when the people with the money are there, the talent, the potential CEOs will come. People like Colin will have less of a problem finding jobs and more people like Colin will come into this uh, area trying to understand where are the opportunities coming up from the hospitals, from ASTAR, from NUS, from NTU, whatever it is. Um, and because they are there, the investors are also there because they say, oh, I don't know what technology or what master you are looking at or what surgical robot you are looking at, but if these guys are looking at it, I'm interested. Um, so we need this sort of a community in that space. Um, that's not, probably not so easy to build, but one of the things that uh, we talked about is, well, if you don't have to do every startup here from within Singapore, from within our hospitals, um, ASTAR, NUS, NTU. Uh, if there are already good, exciting um, startups out there, I, from Israel, from China, from um, Paris, Berlin, uh, we can get them interested in Singapore's ecosystem. They come here to do their um, startup Series A funding or whatever it is. We've got more things abuzz and more people who have more things to look at. And that will serve us very well. So there are three stages, three areas that we need to develop. And I think the idea is to develop each one of these concurrently and not sequentially. Um, and if these three things are in place and they are developing and maturing, I think we get a lot more fluency, right, from problems to ideas to inspiration, innovation. I was listening to your lecture. Um, and then investments, right, uh, getting into investments. Because then they are the investors who will be around, who are willing to back, to try and do. One more thought, if, if I have time for. Um, in this space, medical technologies, yes, biopharma, but everybody knows it's going to be a bit difficult. Medtech has a nice interface um, between the many opportunities that we have. We have spoke, uh, spoken about this many times before. But the unique thing about this compared to some proposals in uh, new electronic chip, IoT, and, um, or, or, or whatever, um, is that it's in the healthcare space, and people have a certain passion and affinity to this. What we have not really exploited in our ecosystem um, is philanthropic funding, not so much to the very early stage, because that's very difficult for them to, to understand. But when you have a startup and a company, uh, a Colin Tan in place, and a, uh, you know, a CEO, an exec team, looking for Series A, Series B funding, 
uh, the family offices um, are a group of people that we should spend some time to corral and have them to understand not just from the ROI viewpoint but maybe also from the philanthropic viewpoint for which their funds can go into an endowment scheme or whatever it is. And that's a space that we could also develop because they could also provide the initial seed funding. And you know how this funding thing works, right? Uh, when it's new, it's the biggest problem is always the first guy, the first million dollars. But once the first million dollar goes into it, it sounds like something's happening. There are a lot of follow-on million dollars. Um, and um, uh, we do need uh, this, this sort of uh, uh, different sources of funding. Yes, the VCs will be there. Um, yes, maybe some of the corporate VCs can also be there because it takes a corporate type uh, perspective. But philanthropic funding, if we could also uh, assemble them, and that is chance, in my opinion, that we could uh, put this together. Uh, the three, four different types of funding blended together uh, in the ecosystem is what makes this ecosystem, well, will take the ecosystem into a, a new level, I think, of, of uh, excitement and maturity, which I think will serve as well. And we need all these three pieces and capabilities and expertise uh, together for this thing to really flow uh, at a level that um, I think we are very ready for. Thanks. Very good. Thank you very much. All of you have described how hard a road this is, and Henry, that, that graph of the ups and downs, the ecstasy and the, and the disappointment, despair is the word you used, is just part of the journey. Can I ask you, how do you sustain the enthusiasm in the relationship? How do you keep going forward during that path? Perhaps, Henry, you, you first, but also, Lawrence, I want to hear from you, because... Uh, because uh, you're busy, you've got lots of things, for all of you on your plate. It's easy to go and do something different. Just like perhaps sometimes it's too easy to leave a relationship when it's not so good, right? <laughs> what makes you stay? I think the, for the I think when the time we uh, our first spin-off was uh, Endomaster. I think at the time I think it was more through. Uh, I would say that we were naive in in those in those days. I think uh, basically, I think uh, we were pushed out to spin off because we, I think we got rejected by all the funding agencies. There's no other way around. I think quite similar to Henry's story, the funding was uh, issues. So then we decided that I think the best way is to go out and then earn our own money rather than relying upon some academic people deciding whether they give you money or not. So I think that one actually taught us a lot that it was possible in those days to, to do it well. And then, of course, we were lucky. I think we got Colin from NUH, pull him out, and then uh, he's ready to do it. Uh, it was a challenge as well because a uh, few people wanted to leave their comfort zone to, to do something which is totally uh, uh, high risk. Uh, as time goes, I think now the ecosystem has uh, matured tremendously, I would say. I think a lot more people are coming in. I think the second startup also got into trouble, uh, but we were safe towards the end. <laughs> so I think I learned it. I learned it. Uh, I think in Silicon Valley, it's called the Bash of Honor each time you fail. But I didn't really, I think we were safe towards the end. Again, through a lot of help from industry people who pull us out and then help us to, to get it. Thing. I think now we are going into the third startup. I would say that things are a lot simpler. We know exactly what to do. We are going to avoid a big time all the mistakes we made before. And uh, plus, I think uh, the funding from Spring now is a lot uh, more structured. They give a lot more flexibility. So I think we now say that, okay, you want to do startup, first two years is okay. Spring will help you first two years, maybe three years. TC and then POV if you're a good, good idea. If you don't make it, fine. It's fine to fail and then come back again because you've got two years to, to show your value. And after that, if you really succeed, the investors will come in to save you and take you from their honor. Their value has gone up. I think now the ecosystem has matured to that level uh, to say that I think it's sustainable. I would say it's sustainable. I don't know whether Philip agrees. I think it's a lot better than the old days. So I think uh, maybe now what we are concerned is the, the pipeline of good ideas. Uh. 
relationships. Uh, serial relationships are good, huh? Is what yeah, you're I think they're sort of learning thing. from the previous relationships to make the next huh, one better. Yeah. <laughs> Henry, can cool. I come back? Just come back to you for a minute. They, you know, you, you said the Stanford by Design program gave you some of the tools to be able to go through the low points. What did they do? Spike your drinks, or what happened? <laughs> Uh, actually, I was listening to Lawrence, and I, I realized there are really three categories of uh, pain they can try to minimize. Uh, one of which, I think, is the clinical team. Uh, I think the clinical team need to be really agree and find that this is a very compelling reason why we're doing this, because along the journey, there'll be a lot of pain on going through all this. And therefore, it has to be really something that the community believes that this is something worth doing. So the second thing is the technical team. The technical team is where the engineers come in, and this is where I, I think I want to go down to the crux of where this forum is about. Where when we first met up, I think the conversation were really different. Uh, when we say it's roughly about one cm, the engineer say, "Is it 0 0.98 or is it 1.02?" So that's the level of conversation that we have, and a lot of clinicians do not. Um, are able to translate into, can I go into the 1.02 CM kind of conversation. So it takes some time for even two groups to even acknowledge that every play, everybody plays a little bit different role. And that takes a bit of time for the team to warm up. And I always can remember one of the first trial we had, and it was really funny, and the room was just set up for the first in man, and the anesthetist walked past and he tripped on the wire, and he went like, hey, is this wire something important for you? And we were like, oh my God, and that, that's the power to the entire machine. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's, those are the angst, and, and that case was postponed. Yeah, we, we couldn't do that case, and, and that was the kind of like, uh, things that can happen. And if you do not have that kind of a strong technical support from the engineers who understand the mission for today is really to ensure that the case goes on, and you know, that kind of thing can really, really happen and jeopardize the entire mission. The third point about avoiding the ups and downs is, is really about the funders. Uh, I was told, and I always recognize that all the time uh, in Stanford, that the minute you get Series A, you are already planning for Series B the minute you get a Series A money. So if you have a POC of 250, you should be thinking, what is your next POC? and you craft your journey for the next POC. You should not be looking at it when you at the end of your POC. So that's how it is like. And therefore, you're always ready to jump the next quantum all the time, and a very fixed goal, what does each quantum serve? You cannot do everything in one go. I, I understand, I recognize Philip's point about, but he was referring to the entire institution, that everybody do different role in it, but as a startup, I think you have to be very clear what kills the cat? What really kills it? If you can't prove it, you cannot get the next funding. I think this is something that one of somebody in the team have to keep thinking about it. So those are my points of uh, how to you kind of kind of make that irregularity a little bit more regular. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So um, to the to the five of you again, uh, uh, twelve of you, the two couples. <laughs> if you are to meet again and do things, how differently are you going to do it? What would you do differently? Yeah, how do you do it differently? If there's anything, anything in the whole process that you're yes, going to do correct. differently. This is a question that's come from at least yes, five people in the I audience. Yes, I think quite a number of people. Yeah. You're going to do it again? What would you do differently? Yeah. I, I think uh, we will probably be timing, like I say, I think the teams will, uh, we will assemble a team, I think, uh, uh, maybe in, the, in a different form. Yeah, because we used to struggle to say that uh, I think, do you need a big team, small team? I think now you cope. We, number one is, I think the most important thing is to face the people. You need to get a good team. Mm -hmm. I would say that we will probably face it in a way that which is, uh, I think the first few people just get the key ones to get through and then uh, face the investment accordingly. We didn't know all these things. Mm -hmm. So I think like for instance, Endomaster, we, we were forced into a marriage with the investor, and now we cannot pull it out. So we, in some ways, it's, uh, we have no choice because the partnership was crucial at that time. So that was the best we could come up with at that time. 
So I think the, the, the team at the time, how much we need, and then the investor, uh, we have to look at the smart investor, not every investor. So that I think long term, it was going to determine your, your value. Because I think Philip mentioned that the first investor will determine the second investor and then subsequent thing. If you make any mistakes in the, along the journey, you may have a bit more challenges in future. Mm. So I think these are the main thing we learn. So now I think the next one, we will be very careful first two years. We'll probably go into more government funding where there's not a lot of constrict restriction. And then make it first and then after that, then we have a bit of breathing space to decide your next uh, step and so forth. And then you can build up a bigger team. And maybe I think in this sense that we also need to think about going more international at an earlier time rather than waiting for five years, 10 years before we jump into the, mm. the, the, into, the, into the market. Say for instance, your market eventually is America. I think you need to start to think about going there early on, seek investors there or into Europe. Agree? I think, I think I'll add to that. Um, I think uh, the two things, I think one thing that we did pretty well, I think, was to, was to get a good team together that really knew what they were doing. I mean, for my experience in medical devices, I, I worked in the US for 10 years in medical device startup. So on the get-go already, we kind of knew what are the key people we need in the company. Um, and I find a lot of startups sometimes, they maybe know they're expert maybe in marketing or they're expert in R&D, but they kind of don't see the whole picture. And no, I know there are a lot of resources to help with that, but I think that's one thing we did pretty okay. I think we could have done better. Um, but I think the key thing, if I had to go back in time and do it again, would be I think I'll get actually more, more user feedback, actually. I'm not saying that because Profo is next to me. But uh, actually, we, we, we got initially a lot of feedback from Profo, obviously. It's a very important clinician. It's the key clinician. But you know, as we develop our prototype, get the funding in, you want to move as quickly as possible. Then suddenly, when you talk to the doctors in Germany or you talk to the doctors in Japan, suddenly you're like, eh? It's actually something else they are interested in, and we actually had to pivot a little bit here and there. Mm -hmm. So actually, yeah, coming back to it, I would say I wish I actually did more of these, um, what we call user feedback or user interviews. Actually, I'll, I'll find I'll probably save more time. I wouldn't have to go back to the drawing board a lot, a lot more than I, than I had to in the past. Interesting. Henry, what, what, is, what, is, what would you do differently? Uh, I'll, I'll still do it. Uh, I'll still get married to uh, Ji Tiong. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, truthfully, if I were to do this again, definitely I'll do it again. I, I'm, I, well, I should not say definitely doing it. we're doing extremely well. Um, but I, I would say that uh, one of the lessons that as a clinician and uh, most of us has a misconception is about the fact that when I own, when somebody owns a pattern, it's not the world. It is a wrong concept, and a lot of people goes out thinking that if I own a patent, means I own the world, and therefore everybody has a very defensive kind of go around the patent and say this is my patent. And seriously, my opinion, if I have to look back and the whole thing, the the patent is like what ten percent, twenty percent of the entire journey. I would say it's really the patent is just the start of the journey. If everybody in the team is able to kind of expand their mind and think that this is not all about the patent and holding a patent. And the entire journey in the commercial is actually a lot more and the people that comes in and, and truly a clinician or an original engineer who will have that idea to run a company may not be the best fit. So therefore, really, I think when you talk about what uh, Philip mentioned about the fourth stage of things where the commercial journey itself, I think there are some really professional people who can come and actually do it better. And I feel that if I were to walk back again the journey, I think... Zcom has come in excellent timing, but you know, at that time, we could have professionalized the entire journey right from the start. I think we could have done it better at that point, and we should recognize the fact that everybody plays a different role, and definitely not me as a clinician. I would not be the best CEO. I think there are always some better CEO somewhere around. I think sourcing for the right person for the right job, as what uh, Philip mentioned, I think is extremely important, and I would say that that would be something that I would change if I were to run this journey again. Philip, one last comment from you. What, what, what's the most, what's the thing that you think is the biggest mistake that everyone seems to make? Um, so, yeah, one uh, idea I think I've uh, made that is that this is a very long journey, multi-stage, and a lot of 
expertise are, are needed. Um, I fully admire the, uh, the clinicians that I have uh, interacted with uh, through the years, but I also noted that uh, clinicians in the art, all their specialties, all the years of, of, of learning and, and developing their art and their, and their mastery, it's always limited to just one organ or two organs at the very most uh, in, the, in the human body. It took them so long to get there. Now, you just think about this. Getting a company into a you know multi you know million dollar enterprise uh, requires specializations at different stages. So if you think a bit like that, then maybe um, we you know can then be clearer about how we can hand on and 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 stage gate ourselves and our efforts and so on. And yes, in some ways we don't get it right all the time and we can just redo it and, and then share the upside with, with other people as we, we go on with the different expertise. Uh, the, there's, there's another um, thought, uh, maybe I, I didn't make it so clear just now, is that again in the healthcare space, um, the clinicians, people like yourselves and people in this room have a, um, uh, a, a role to play in terms of educating entrepreneurs. Uh, we need to get more people interested in, 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 in this space of early stage um, technologies going forward, especially in healthcare. Uh, it is a big problem that uh, we need to address. We need more solutions out there. We need more solutions in enterprises because um, that is still, I think, the best way of distributing good healthcare innovations in enterprise. It's the most sustainable way of doing so. And we need more of this expertise to come in. And for them to come in, they need to understand the mechanics of healthcare enterprises a little bit better, um, what problems they are solving, uh, why you, know, you are so passionate about uh, a particular idea, a product, um, and how they can then help you. And there's a process of education. Now, these are people from old money. They made tons of money from what? Property, trading. Um, trading currencies and da, 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 and all these kind of things. And, and more of them are just getting out of the woodworks, coming out of the, uh, you know, crawling out of the cracks and then kind of say, okay, so there's a world called healthcare out there. It sounds interesting. How do I get into it? There's a whole phase of education to educate these people and orientate them to the possibilities uh, in this space. Um, and I think uh, we, we can be more concerted in how we then engage them uh, and help them come into our space. And when more of them come into this space, it'll be a heck of a lot, lot more exciting for all of us. What a great point to, yes. to finish on. I think you'll agree that there have been some incredible insights coming out of this panel, this expert panel of champion innovators from Singapore. I must say thank you very much. Thank you very much. To, you know, to Lawrence, to Colin, to Philip, to Chi Tiong, and to Henry. Thank you, Yongju, for my yeah. co-chair. Thank you all the audience who've uh, contributed questions. We got through quite a number of them. There were a few more. I didn't pick up the one on physicians and surgeons becoming the same because that <laughs> is clearly an impossibility. And uh, just one final thought to fly up the flag. I think you saw the, hang the, the napkin that Lawrence showed. Every great innovation has a drawing on a, on a napkin. Has anyone else had one in the audience? I've had one. Barry's had one. Yep, there's another one over there. Don't forget the napkin. The iPad is not everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay.